Have you ever visited the pyramids in Egypt? None of you? Okay, go there, but not now. Egypt is not the best place now to go, but <laughs> it was an interesting symbol of the entire Egyptian culture. They called it Ma'at. What was Ma'at? Ma'at was the divinely instituted order in society. At the base of the pyramid, there were the slaves. Then you had different other people who were working as in different trades. Land workers who did not own the land, but they were working as, you know, on a daily basis, were paid for their labor and others. Then you had the next layer was those who were working for like soldiers in the military, used to do bigger projects, build different things. Then you had the, I would say aristocracy, but that was not called that way back then. And then you had the priests and the different officials, and then highest level was Pharaoh, who was the embodiment of God. Now, this order could not be changed, which means slaves will have to be slaves for ever. You cannot really move too much up and down the pyramid. Who had the power? The closest you get to the top of the pyramid. Who had the least power at the base of the pyramid? Why is this important? Because when you see something happening between God and Pharaoh, you see that God is talking to Pharaoh in his own language. Somebody asked me the question, why? Why is God doing this? Why is God, you know, killing people there? Because it seems that God sometimes, and most of the time, and I would say even always, chooses to speak the language that people could understand. And the only language that Pharaoh could understand was the language of power. Now, he chooses Moses as his representative, and Moses then gets Aaron as his spokesperson. The first three miracles are presented or performed by whom? You remember that? It's interesting. Not by Moses, but by Aaron. And these miracles are falsified by whom? By the sorcerers of Pharaoh. And the, 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 the other miracles up to number nine are performed through whom? Through Moses. And these are not falsified because they are not able to do it anymore by the sorcerers. But the last one is God himself stepping on the scene. Why? Because I believe that is there is beyond the Pharaoh somebody else who is behind the Pharaoh. And this is Lucifer or Satan himself. He is in charge of this pyramid system. And he is reaping the benefits to the full. And when God says, I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt, basically, this is somebody or some other creatures that are behind the scene. Now, why is this important? We have to understand that God is never fighting against people in themselves. The war that God has is against sin. And of course, against sin, wherever sin is happen to be and to reach its climax. Now, if you speak with Christians, Christians usually do not have any problem by saying that in the end, God is going to make a judgment. Is that okay? 
I mean, at the end of the world, God is going to judge the world and say, okay, this is it or that's it. Is that okay? Every, all Christianity says, oh, that's not a problem. I mean, that's fine. And many other religions say, yeah, there will be a judgment in the end. But if God decides to bring that judgment into history, we have a problem with it. So why is he doing that? In some cases, God decides not to wait. Now, why? And the only, sometimes the only example I use is that of a surgeon. You know, if you look only at, at that particular issue, let's say you have to amputate the leg of somebody. It, this is terrible, isn't it? I need to cut the leg of a young boy. That's terrible. But if that saves the, the, the life of that boy, is that okay? Yes, it is. But if you only look at that gruesome intervention of cutting somebody's leg, that's terrible. But if you look at the bigger picture, it is saving the person. Now, what God is at is saving humanity. And his purpose is to save as many as he can. But in that process, sometimes he has to choose to make a surgical intervention. And as I look at the Canaanite problem, I look at it as a surgery. And you will see why. Now, uh, here we go. So we concluded that it seems that God's initial purpose was not for the Israelites to fight. He said, I will do it for you. You stand still. And if we read the Bible attentively, you look at Exodus 23, 28, 32, 2, God promises that he is going to send the, and, and, and some translations say the hornet. And the Hebrew says hatsira, And hatsira can mean hornet. But this is a word that also means terror or fear. And if you have listened to yesterday's presentation at noon, uh, Joshua chapter 2, what was Rahab saying to the Israelites? Our hearts have melted with fear because of what we have heard. But that's far away. But if you look at Joshua, God said, I have sent the hornets. And, and you ask yourself, I have read through the whole history and I have never seen one single occasion when God sent the hornet. But of course, he didn't send the hornets. He sent his fear to go ahead and prepare the way. Now, now comes the big question. Okay, you tell us that God has never intended his people to get involved in this messy thing that is called warfare. Then why, in the end, did they end up fighting in a war that God said, go and kill them? I like you to remember these two things. The text from Exodus 14, 14, I will fight for you. And this quote from Ellen White. I know some people say, why do you need Ellen White? Because I always say, because she helps me to understand the, Bibles, the Bible better. It's in the Bible, because it says, you will not have to fight. But Ellen White always brings something, a little something more. And she says, if the children of Israel had not murmured against the Lord, he would not have suffered their enemies to make war with them. And there is another one, I don't know if I have it here, in which she says, God has never intended for the Israelites to conquer the promised land by warfare. Wow. You have a question? Uh, yes. You're saying that the A plan was... Plan A. The ideal plan. Was to uh, drive the Canaanites out of the country. 
Yes. Uh, that means driving them out of the country to start, to start to there because they have no land anymore. Like, how is that a better plan than for That's a good question. You, 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 you could hear the question? No. He says, yeah, but basically, if God wants to just not to kill them, but just to drive them out, basically that would have meant death for them because they would starve to death. Yes and no. This was, if you look at history, this was a, a period of intense migration. People were going back and forth. And we have example, even in the Bible, this is in the book of Judges, when they are fighting, I think it's chapter 4, I have to look up the text. It says that they went to the city and they said to this person, if you show us the secret way to the city, we'll spare your life. Which he did. And then it says, and he then moved to the land of the Hittites and settled there. So resettling was an option. It was not an easy option, but it was an option, a possible option. Resettling was only done by uh, a big amount of people resettling, meant that when you arrived somewhere, someone was there and you had to take possession of the land, which meant another war. Like, it implied wars and uh, more people dying. <clears throat> I don't see it like from my at land. I mean, it's pretty messy. It looks pretty messy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. It can be pretty messy. But you have to understand the second principle. And th this is a little... Ri what I'm going to say is highly risky. But I hope you will understand me. You cannot possibly save a life by amputating a leg without having a bloody procedure. Now, I say, it's risky what I say, but God, when God comes to save humanity from the mess in which they have gotten themselves into, he will have to play in the sandbox of humanity. He cannot play outside the box. He has to come into our world and play in our world. But now, I don't want to say that God is playing by our rules. I want to say he plays by his rules, but he has to play with our reality. He has to take it from where it is. And that involves sometimes from messy business. And this is a text, there is a text in, let me see if I can get there. Uh, let me see if I have, oh no, it will come. A text in Isaiah in which says that God will raise up and, and fight and he will do his work, his unusual or strange work. Even the Bible recognizes that for God to destroy life is strange and unusual. But in this context of the great controversy in which sin is a reality, Sometimes this is unavoidable. Now, again, I tell you, we have to put this into a context greater than what it is. And this context is the context of the great controversy. Again, also the question of, and what about the children? Who was that who asked me that? Yes, that question. What about the innocent children? And my question again is, what is better for a child? from eternity's perspective to, to die at an innocent age saying God as creator says my child let me take you back to myself and I will call you back to life for eternity or let these children grow up in a context in a cultural context in which they will be certainly doomed to death or lose the possibility of eternity forever because of the context in which they are born. So I say again, I don't have questions to everything. It might involve warfare. It might not. Look at Abraham. He is moving and he can under get an understanding with Abimelech. 
yes, if this is a period of migration, migration is a phenomenon that might involve war. On the other hand, it might involve also some negotiations. So it's not necessary that you will have to fight. It depends if you can find a political agreement or, you know, I, I mean, yes, we always have to ask, it could have happened that way, but it could have happened the other way around too. Okay, this is my try. Okay, let me continue. Allow me to recap just until now. So we have a clear path, yes? One, we have to look at this issue in the context of the great cosmic conflict between good and evil. God is love, love created free beings, and free beings are ultimately the explanation for whatever happens. Now, second thing, when God calls Israel, he is not intending for Israel to be involved in warfare. And now we are at the question, if this is the case, why? And my, my take on this is the following. At the beginning, God took them out, he performed miracles, he provided food, drink, whatever they needed, shelter from heat, shelter from cold in the night. And what, what were the Israelites doing? Complaining all the time. Complaining, complaining, complaining. And God wants to tell them that he is taking care of them. Now, you do everything. You send them birds flying, you know, it's just to have something to eat, everything. And they still complain. So tell me, do you have any other better way to let them understand that they depend on you than allowing their enemies to attack them? And this is what happens. We get to Exodus 17, and there is a war. The Amalekites attack them from the back. Where are the children, the older ones, and the, the, you know, those who are weak? And then there is a war. And imagine this scene. Moses' hands are high and up. Now, this is a bunch of people who never studied warfare. Israelites didn't know how to fight, really. They had sticks. They never had swords. And the Amalekites were a war-waging nation with, you know, with bows, with swords, with everything. And on horses, and you are with bare hands and on your foot. And this horseman is coming. And what do you do? The only thing you can do is you close your eyes and you wait for the last moment. And you hear a big noise, you open your eyes, and the Amalekite is gone. I mean gone, in the sense that he is down with horse and everything. When the hands of Moses were not up, what happened? Nobody stopped the Amalekites. I mean, you try everything. You try everything. Nothing works. And then you say, okay, I will have to try the last resort I have. I will have to show them that I am with them. They can rely on me. I am able to take them where I promised to take them. And, and this is what happens. God says, okay, then this is, I take them into extreme situations to understand the lesson that I provide for them. But something else happens. You remember? You read through the book, you get to book, the book of Numbers, and they rebel. When the spies come back, two of them say, yes, this is a good land. God is able to give it to us. But ten of them, what, what do they say? No. There are the big ones, the Amalekites, you know, the giants. We are not able to fight. We are not able to conquer the land. And then all... What, what does the text say? You remember? The heart of the people 
melted with fear. What should have happened to the Canaanites happened to the Israelites because of the bad report that they brought. And then God says, okay, if you think you are, are not able to give you the land, then you stay here in the desert for 40 years. Now, in those 40 years, the situation has changed. Imagine... So I have to carry this. <laughs> it's such a nuisance. Imagine the scene. I'm trying to depict this scene for you. God... As always, he's having an argument, you know, with Satan. You know, you know that Satan had access to God. You see it in the book of Job. And you, it's only after the cross he's completely banished from the presence of God. But up to then, you know, he was coming and, you know, having some nice uh, ethical dilemmas with God, talking about these issues. And I imagine him saying, you know, so you say that these are your people? You want to save the world through these bunch of rebellious people? These are your people? You tell me, don't touch them, they are mine? Look at them. Look at them. I mean, this, they worship the golden calf? I mean, by the way, do you know what the golden calf is? And God says, yes, I know, I know. Don't have to tell me what the golden calf means. You see the background? What Ellen White says, if they hadn't murmured, the Lord wouldn't have allowed their enemies to fight against them. I mean, this is the great controversy. God had chosen a people. He says, through these people, I'm going to make my ways known to the world. Satan says, deal done. Okay, good try. Let's see what you do. And then, look at them. And, and Satan says, allow me, and my people will fight against your people. God says, no, you don't touch them. These are mine. And he says, you, you, know, you possibly cannot have the right to protect them. They are not playing by your rules. They are playing by my rules. They are mine. So God doesn't have any more the moral authority, so to say, to say no to Satan. And the Amalekites... They have to allow them to attack. But then he intervenes and protects them. So this is, this is the background. You, you have to understand what is going on behind the scenes. Okay, now. But after that, something changes. The Canaanites knew that the Israelites were coming and they were afraid. But all of a sudden they, they hear the news. Have you heard Oh, these big people that we were so afraid of them. You remember the case of Balaam and Balak? Why is Balak resorting to or resorting to, to sorcery? I need somebody who can curse these people. Again, warfare worldview. There are other powers that are higher, that are involved in this picture. So I need somebody who is stronger than them. Who can stop them? Tell me, what, what is the time we have to stop? <coughs> At? Okay, well, we have to rush up. But then, in this context, <clears throat> they say, but they are lost in the desert for 40 years. Come on, we, we were afraid of these people. Come on, they are not strong. They are not mighty. They are not a threat for us. And at the same time, you remember that the, the wickedness of the Amalekites was growing and growing and growing. And now we get to a situation in which, first, God says, we have to take plan B. Plan A was, I will fight for you. But because of your rebellion, in this great controversy context, I cannot do it anymore. Why? Because you have lost the right for me to intervene fully on your behalf. You have a part to play. I am under constant accusation from the arch enemy that I'm doing this and you are still playing by his rules and not by my rules. You understand? 
what is going on? You know, if I were God, I would have said, I'm done with you guys. That's it. I just give up on you. But you will be a parent one day. And I wish that you will have easygoing children. But some of you might not. And you know, some days you will feel like, ah. Oh. But it will take only a few moments and you will say, yes. But he is my, he is my son. Or she is my daughter. I cannot just give up so easily on my children. I will do everything it takes and everything I can. And this is God. He says, okay, I will take you from where you are. And the, to, to me, this is good news because it tells me how God is. If I were God, I would have chosen somebody else, you know. And he even tests Moses at a certain moment, says, let me, you know, do away with them and I will make you into a great nation. And Moses shows that he has the character of a leader, the character of God. He says, no, no, no. If you want to do this, first you deal with me and then you can deal with them. So, so far, so good. We have to go to God doesn't give up on them. And then something else now. We have to make a difference between dispossession and an annihilation. And I made an extensive analysis of all the terms that deal with this issue. Now, if you have another day or two, I can go into details, but I will not do it. So you will have to believe me and you can do your own study. But there are terms that speak about dispossessing, like to drive out, to bring into confusion, to send away, cast out, to push away. You have the Hebrew terms, but you don't need to bother with those. And then you have terms of annihilation, such as to destroy, to annihilate, to tear down. You know what is interesting? The terms that you see on the left refer to people and people groups. The terms that you see on the right refer to inanimate objects, such as places of worship, cities, walls, objects that have to be destroyed. The clear picture from the beginning, God says, I'm going to drive them out. And you are supposed to destroy everything that is left behind and that has to do with idolatry and idol worship. You destroy those. Sometimes we have this... Yes, question. Okay. And one more thing, why, why does God use his people to do the worship? Okay, so the, the first question is, what about Deuteronomy 20? Deuteronomy 20 is the law of war. And again, I speak ideal plan. In Deuteronomy 20, this is not the ideal plan. This is plan B. But God makes a difference between the Canaanites and the others. And says the Canaanites, they are to be destroyed. But this is again an interesting thing. Because there is a difference between two kinds of Canaanites. The ones that are willing to move out, to be dispossessed. And the ones that resist God's will and they rebel and fight. Now, just take an example. The Gibeonites. Joshua chapter 9. You remember what happens? They were Canaanites. So what should have happened to them according to Deuteronomy 20? They should have been destroyed. But they come with a little trick. And they didn't ask God. And you know what? 
I could see God smiling. I mean, if, if really God wanted to kill all these people just like that, you know, then he could have intervened through a prophet or to tell Joshua, Joshua, be careful because they are tricking you. Be careful. But God doesn't do that. I could almost see God smiling. Okay, okay, smart people. I like it. Let them get away with this. And they are not killed. If, not, not even they are not killed. They are, they, they are the ones that work for the sanctuary. They come as close as possible to the revelation of God's will. To understand who God was, how he functioned, what he wanted to do. So, I come back to your question. First of all, I believe that the ideal plan was dispossession. Second, the rebellious, obstinate Canaanites that wanted to oppose to God's plan, they will have to face violence. That's clear. And I have to admit this. This is a difficult thing to admit. But let me tell you. One day, you I, I use illustrations because it's easier to convey the idea. One day you come home, and somebody is sitting on your sofa in the living room, and he's asking you, hello, whom are you looking for? And you are puzzled and say, whom I am looking for? I'm in my house. And he says, yes, it used to be yours, but from today on, this is my house. And you try to convince this guy to leave your house, to, you know, this is your house. And he said, no, no. It used to be yours, this is mine. What do you do? Now, if I am that person, and I put up in my mind that I'm not going to leave your house, talk me out of the room if you can. What do you do? You call police. That's it. So, I think that in some situations, we all recognize that sometimes, in some situations, there is a legitimate use of force. There's no other way. And I also think that in the context of the great controversy, in which there is evil and there is good, in some situations, there is a, there is a, a legal or permissible use of force. It's no other way. I see another hand. Yes. Okay, now, that, that opens a whole different other chapter, which is the hardening of the heart. I have done a study on that. It starts with the Pharaoh, by the way. In the case of the Pharaoh, and that helps to understand this situation. As I don't know how far you want to go. I can answer all these questions to a certain extent. But let me say, tell you that there are there are 20 times references, 20 references in which the Bible speaks about the hardening of the Pharaoh's heart. In 10 references, it says that God hardened the Pharaoh's heart. In 10 other references, it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Which one is real? Both. The revelation of God put Pharaoh into a situation that he had to make a decision and a choice. And his choice, out of free will, was to go against God. And I think and I believe that that's the same situation with the Canaanites. God reveals himself through different ways, and then they will have to choose. And this is reality today as well. The revelation of God makes people into a position that they have to choose. You cannot be neutral anymore. And they have to make up their minds. And those who go against this revelation, they harden their hearts. The same sun melts butter and toughens clay, depending on what kind of attitude you have. And the same revelation of God will make some people soften their hearts and others harden their hearts. So, I mean, this is a very short answer, but I could go into all the terms and the usage and everything, but that's another seminar, probably, for another time. 
Okay, are you still with me? Okay, we have a long way to cover, but we cover as much as we can. <clears throat> so, I come back to Deuteronomy 20 because this is important. I believe that in the case of Deuteronomy 20, we see something. God says, the Canaanites are obstinate, rebellious, and they have reached the point of no return. That's it. So in, his, in this case, we need surgery. We need to amputate. That's it. In order, for, in order for us to save humanity as much as we can. But for the rest of your enemies, what is the first thing that you have to do? It's still in Deuteronomy 20. You read it? It says, offer them what? Peace. Offer them peace. And, and if you look at the Old Testament, I mean, we, we can do this forever, but it's amazing to see that God, and that's why I say it's surgery, because God has limited this destructive activity to a certain period of time and to a certain geographic area. He never allowed and wanted the Israelites to do this to any other people. And the second thing that I want to say, and this is also equally important, is that God treats Israel in the same way when they started to act as the Canaanites. You read the book of Jeremiah or Hosea, and, and you feel the struggle in God's heart. How can I give up? How can I do this? But he arrives at the conclusion, I have to. And he allows the Babylonians, first the Assyrians to come, and then the Babylonians to come, and do the same thing to his own people again, because they have rebelled. They have started to live as the Canaanites used to live before. And God says, enough is enough. So he doesn't have a double standard. We cannot say, you know, God is chauvinistic. He had chosen the Israelites, and the rest he couldn't care less. No. He has the same standard for Israel as he had for the Canaanites. And when the Israelites reach the same level, it is the same thing for them again. <clears throat> this is my conclusion. God doesn't have a fight with humanity. He has a fight against sin. And he tries to solve the problem of sin by first limiting it, controlling it as much as he can. And if you read the whole Old Testament, it's an interesting story. Because you have first humanity, then the, the fall, then you have Adam and Eve, then you have the flood. What is the flood doing, basically? It's limiting the effects of sin. Then what, is Babel has, what does Babel have to do with, with all these issues? You know, God, Languages. I mean, it wouldn't be easier to talk to... Now I could say it in Hungarian far better and faster. Except that a few of you could understand. But God limits the effects of sin by limiting it, you know, by communication. So this is the whole story about it, limiting it, putting it in a quarantine, if you want. Okay, recap, quickly. This is God's ideal plan. What is that? You've, you stand still, I fight for you. Israel rebels. God says, okay, situation has changed. We switch to plan B. You will have a part to do. Okay, God's initial plan, dispossession, not annihilation. But Canaan rebels. I mean, imagine that the Holy Spirit was not just sitting and watching. He was working as much as the heart, on the heart of the Israelites as he was working on the heart of the Canaanites. But they rebel, and God says we have to switch gears, we have to change plans. But even so, only those who rebelled were destined for, for destruction. And this was a surgical intervention that was limited in time, only to the period of the conquest, and geographically to the borders of Canaan. And later, we will not have time to enter this, but later if you see that even David starts to build his own empire. 
And God says, no, 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 no. You cannot build my temple. Why? You remember the answer? There is just too much blood sticking to your hands. And you ask yourself, but wasn't David fighting the battles of the Lord? And I would say, yes, some. But some others, no. And even you have texts in the Bible like this, you know, you know, we will fight for ourselves and let God do whatever he wants to do. Wow. It went so far. So I think that there is in the Bible a building up an empire that God never wanted for Israel to have. In fact, he never wanted for them to have a king. That's another discussion. And God said, okay, you want a king? I will give you a king, but you will see what is in there too. Okay. But I always say that there is a better way. And that better way is in, for example, you have examples here and there, the way of peace. And you remember when the, uh, the Syrians come to attack Israel and Elisha says, God, make them blind. And all of a sudden they are blind. And now they say, let's take them to the capital. And all of a sudden they are in a closed city in the middle of the main square and their eyes are open. And they say, uh-oh, what happens? And the king of Israel asked ask the question, Father, because that's how they call the prophets, do you want me to strike them down? And what is the answer of Elisha? Today, is this the time to kill? No. Prepare a feast for them. Just make them happy. Give them something to eat and drink, and then let them go home. And the Bible says, for a long period of time, the Syrians didn't attack Israel again. I believe that God will always choose the way of peace. If there is a way. And he will never, ever resort to the, to the way of violence unless there is no other way. I mean... The final judgment, if you look at, at the, the history, of, is going to be violent. I mean, if we like it or not, this is going to be. And you have to admit, this is it. But God respects the free choice of people. And he reveals whatever he can reveal to them in order for them to make a good choice. But in the end, we'll have to answer to what we have done. And then Jesus comes and he lifts or elevates this whole warfare issue to a completely different level, to a spiritual level. And if you read the Old Testament, the fight is spiritual. Ephesians 6, Paul says, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Our fight is against the principalities and the powers that are out there. And why is this significant? Because I believe that theocracy is over. And today we cannot say that there is a state or a group of people on earth that is directly governed by God as was Israel during the time of the Urim and the Thummim. I always conclude with this. The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. And the God of the New Testament is the Father. And Jesus said, if you want to know the Father, look at me. If you have seen me, whom you have seen? The Father. Sometimes it is difficult. Because you look at all these gruesome texts in the Bible and we come up with the idea the Old Testament God is a cruel tyrant and the New Testament God oh yes that's the father of Jesus Christ the smiling lovely grandpa I think we need to understand that it is the same God 
the God of the Old Testament is not different from the God of the New Testament. And if Jesus reveals God to us, and we have to understand that if these bad things happen, there must be a reason for them. Sometimes we don't understand the whole thing because it's complicated. I mean, sometimes we try to explain complicated things to children, and it's just difficult. It's difficult because they, they are lacking some chips in their head that will trigger some answers. They will not. And I understand that this reality of this world is complex, and we are lacking some elements that will help us to fully understand. But if we understand one thing, God is love. And whatever happened, that was probably the only and the best solution at the given moment in the given context and conditions. I think it can at least give us some answers, not all the answers, but some answers. I will stop here. I will allow time for some questions and uh, probably we'll have to wrap it up. You, uh, go to you. Let me go to, to her because she never had a question. You, you already had some. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will answer that very quickly. Why is the Bible saying don't kill in the Ten Commandments and then God says kill? Okay, first thing, the Sixth Commandment refers to premeditated man slaughter outside of the context of justice. Okay? And if we look at the context of Israel, they still had the, the capital punishment. So this cannot exclude the capital punishment because it's the same God who says, yes, you can. Ratsa is the, uh, uh, um, the, the Hebrew word, and it refers to premeditated manslaughter. Now, if we look at the, these, the, the context of war and we take it as an act of divine judgment, then basically it is outside of the context of the Sixth Commandment. This is my very quick and short answer to that. <clears throat>